I want to give a, a shout out to our friends in Albuquerque and Iowa and uh, South Carolina. Did I say that right? All right. I love hearing about you guys joining us in worship and the word. <clears throat> Before we start, I, I just want to make mention of a headline that I saw in the newspaper this morning. We, uh, we want to keep Israel in our prayers. Uh, they have been under attack, and uh, some 6,700 rockets have been launched from Lebanon since October 8th, 6,700. Most have been intercepted, but uh, they've been fired at residential areas, churches and schools and hospitals. Well, Israel made a what the paper's calling a preemptive strike because they're loading up to make a massive attack. And uh, even yesterday, Lebanon... Uh, fired 150 rockets. So Israel has said enough is enough. So when you read the headlines in the paper, you might want to look for another source to get the whole story. The preemptive attack by Israel was really a counterattack for months of attack. So I want to pray for Israel this morning as we start. Heavenly Father, thank you for making us aware of our, our kinship in spirit with your children Israel. We've been adopted into your family by faith. We don't take that for granted. And as we're reading and studying this book of Romans, which you've given us, I pray you sharpen our understanding and our appreciation for your love and care for us. Teach us from your word by your Holy Spirit this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll talk to you later. It's good to see you. Congratulations for sticking with me through one of the most difficult studies we've ever done as we covered Romans 9 last week. I didn't get... Any questions this week? Well, except for one. And <laughs> you, <laughs> you all came back. So thank you for that. I appreciate the support. <laughs> but just to recap on Chapter 9, for those who might have missed it, and you know, uh, Ron has been really faithful in recording our studies. So if you ever miss it or you're out of town, you can dial it up. But I'll give you a short recap here. We studied the paradox of God's sovereignty and man's free will. We set it up by reviewing Romans 8, 28 through 30. And I prefer the New American Standard Bible translation, which uses the best manuscript to begin this verse. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Is that a mouthful? These are the blessings of God's grace to those of us who have responded to his love. These verses speak about God's sovereignty in knowing us, in calling us, in sanctifying us, until he ultimately glorifies us and brings us into his presence at the end of our earthly lives. 
we talked about the doctrine of election and how it doesn't absolve us from responsibility for committing our will to God for responding to God's call makes it possible for us to experience the abundant life that Christ promised now as well as the eternal life that also begins now and extends into eternity. Now, I encouraged you not to worry about who's chosen or even if you were chosen. Now, if you've accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are chosen and that you're born again of the Spirit to understand the things of God. You will grow in love with the Lord and a desire to please Him you will become, in fact, more like Him. And you will bear the fruit of the Spirit in your own life. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Now, who could dislike any of these fruits that we might partake of from our brothers and sisters? This uh, is the evidence that you are chosen. Now, this week, we'll cover chapter 10. Chapter 10 conveys God's concern for the Jews and also his plan for the Gentiles. Chapter 10 makes it clear that man has a responsibility to choose to follow. This is a response of the heart. And you'll notice in this chapter that we read today, the word heart occurs four times. It's the heart of the teaching. Now, as Gentiles, we've learned that Jesus is an equal opportunity savior. Israel rejected their promised Messiah, and God extended the invitation to Gentiles. Now, this chapter contains another important word that I highlighted before. It's whoever. Twice we re read the word whoever with the promises. Whoever believes in him, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Never mind whether you feel called or not. You call upon him, you are saved. In addition, this chapter contains a, a reference to the Great Commission that Jesus gave just before his resurrection. As in chapter 9, Paul begins by expressing his concern. Let's read about it from verse 1 of chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. There's no righteous to be, righteousness to be attained beyond Christ. He is the end of it. He's accomplished it all with his death on the cross and resurrection to prove that his sacrifice was acceptable. It was sufficient. Now, despite God's sending of the law and prophets, Israel was ignorant of God's righteousness and how to attain it, which was only and has always been by faith. Yes. And they were zealous to try to live by the law, 
but they tried to achieve their own righteousness apart from faith. Today, many religious people have zeal but lack the knowledge of salvation by God's grace through faith. They may be diligent in knocking on doors, in paying tithes, or obeying church teachings. However, their zeal is often motivated by false teachings that they have to do works to be saved. And they're ignorant of the word of God and the gospel of grace. Well, Israel was without excuse because God had given them the law, the prophets, and the promises, including Messiah. But they lacked understanding that the law was given as a tutor to show them their need for grace because no one can keep the law. No, no one, not one, according to Romans 3.10, which we read some years ago. Righteousness comes only by faith. Paul described himself as zealous for the law. And before he was called by Christ, he was zealous to establish his own righteousness. And you know how he showed or lived his zealousness. He was ignorant of God's grace and persecuted Christians, even to the death. Now, Galatians 3, 24 and 25, I've referred to before, but it just reminds us the purpose of the law was to be our tutor, to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Now, how is the law a tutor? It showed man's need to live by faith, since he fell short of righteousness by works. In Old Testament times, Israel was given some 300 prophecies of a Messiah who would come to save them. But they failed to understand that the Messiah would save them from sin, not from Roman rule. So they rejected him, it says in John 1.11. But salvation has always come by faith not by works. We know that Abraham, the father of faith, was saved by faith. We'll use Galatians again, where chapter 3, verse 5 says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Moses, to whom God gave the law, was also an example of faith. Moses quickly learned that he couldn't deliver Israel from slavery by himself. For you know he was exiled into the desert for 40 years after he killed an Egyptian slave master. When he was in Egypt, he had the authority that came from being Pharaoh's grandson. But in the desert, he learned worldly authority means nothing. Moses learned that he was a nobody until God called him and he responded by faith. Maybe hesitant faith, but by faith nevertheless. Without faith, he would not have gone back to Egypt where there was still a warrant out for him for murder. But with faith, he let God use him to confront Pharaoh and deliver Israel with ten amazing miracles. Let's go on in verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks this way. 
Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. I'll leave you in suspense there. There was no need to go on a quest to find the Messiah whom God promised because he already came. Someone doesn't have to find by some works their way to heaven to bring a, a savior or to bring to them salvation or go into the depths of hell and experience all the sin of the world in order to magnify God's grace by comparison. Paul contrasts the righteousness of faith with the righteousness of works, which is impossible to have. Now Israel took pride in the law and even added their own laws to the 622 that God gave. And they held their own laws even higher than the word of God. But as they loved the law, they loved the law more than the giver of the law. In Deuteronomy 5.29, God said, oh, that they had the law, whoops, sorry, oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments out of a heart to do so, that it might go well with them and with their children forever. Now, the law is good, and there are benefits to keeping it with the right heart attitude. But now it is fulfilled in Christ, for he is the end of the law. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6 says, Hear, O Israel. This is called the Shema. The Lord our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart with the heart, we love and trust. The righteousness of faith acknowledges that the Messiah has now come and fulfilled the prophecies and the law. He's come down from heaven, died for our sin, and was raised from the dead. We don't have to go and look for him. He's already come. He's within us by our invitation in response to his call. He fulfilled all the prophecies concerning the first coming of the Messiah. And that gives us confidence to believe the prophecies concerning his second coming. So there's no need for us to go looking for any other Messiah. 1 Corinthians 15 3 through 4 says, Christ died for our sin according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's it. In the gospel, the gospel in one verse. Now verse 8, but what does it say? The word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Paul quotes from Deuteronomy 30, 14 and 15, which says, but the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil in that I command you today to love the Lord your God and to walk in his ways. When we love someone, we commit our hearts to them. The word Moses speaks of is God's law, the word, which must be accepted by faith. It was in their mouth because they memorized it and recited it twice a day. It was in their heart by faith if they believed it was actually from God or why else would they commit it to memory? 
William Hendrickson wrote the book called More Than Conquerors, in which he said, when grace changes a heart, submission out of fear changes to submission out of love. Psalm 119 is all about the excellence of God's word. Verse 11 says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Verse 92 says, unless your law had been my delight, the delight of my heart, I, I would have perished in my affliction. In verse 97, oh, how I love your law. Now, even more than then, the word of God is available to almost everyone in every form imaginable. And there's no excuse, unfortunately, for my religious friend at the gym who said that he made a New Year's resolution to start reading the Bible every day. But he didn't know where to start. So I suggested to him the Gospel of John because he wouldn't get very far until he came face to face with the Savior. For several days, I asked him how he was doing and if he knew who the Word was. The Word became flesh. And he didn't have the answer. He didn't have the answer because he never started reading. And don't we say that the world is paved with good intentions? And that's, that's as close as he's gotten so far to knowing the one about whom the word is written. He is ignorant and relies on his good works and religious practices for righteousness, not knowing that he falls short. And his heart is not in it. He just does it because that's tradition, and he thinks he's supposed to. One more comment here. Is it fair for God to command us to love him with all our heart, mind, and strength? How can you command love? I submit to you, yes, it is fair if you know the character of God. Because... I don't believe our God would command anything that he wouldn't also give us the power to do. I don't believe he would command anything that he wouldn't also give us the power to do. The power of the Holy Spirit. We need his power to love him, even though he is perfectly lovable. And we need his power even more to love others who are less lovable. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says, Beloved, love one another, for love is of God. He who does not lo know God does not love. Now, love is the first fruit of the Holy Spirit living in our lives. So, how's your love life? To know God is to love Him. To know Him is to love Him. Now, you've often heard me quote the next verse, verse 9, and I encourage you to do what it says, but only as an expression of faith, not a work. Verse 9 and 10 say, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 1 Corinthians 12.3 says, No one can say that Jesus is Lord from their heart except by the Holy Spirit. 
This means that it's not just the words that save, but the heart response to Jesus that receives salvation. The mouth and the heart must be in harmony. The act of salvation begins in the heart as a faith response to God's grace. Then it is proven by our confession, our baptism, our witness, and works of the Spirit, which He fills us to do. Verse 11, for the Scripture says, whoever, 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 I want to emphasize that, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever, whoever, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here again, believing precedes acting. If we believe, we will call on the Lord and be saved. Now, if any of you think that you're beyond saving or wonder if you're chosen, the word whoever applies to you as it does to me. This calling of the Lord and our response of calling on him is an expression of faith. This is man's responsibility. Now there's no excuse for the gospel has gone out to all the world. If we believe it, we will want to share it with others because we love them or should. We should love them with the love that comes only from God, realizing that He's impartial. He loves them just as much as he loves us. Now next is the reminder of the great commission that Jesus gave before he ascended back into heaven. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? There are a lot of elements to this question. Again, Paul is using rhetorical questions to answer the anticipated objections of some. And you've heard them. In Paul's day, there was a need for missionaries and he mentored others to go out. But in our day, despite the availability of the gospel to nearly everyone, you've heard critics say, well, what about the heathen in Africa? who've never heard the gospel. Speaking of Africa, the church in Africa is alive and well, more so than in the United States. The Christian church in Africa is growing faster than on any other continent. In contrast, in Europe and in America, Christianity is declining. Now, I believe, furthermore, that God is able to make himself known even without a missionary. God doesn't need us to fulfill his plan. But he desires for us to be a participant, to use us as his vessels. To me, that's a great experience. We are privileged to be a part of his plan when he chooses us to be his mouthpiece to share the gospel. And I have to tell you, there's no greater thrill than to see 
the light go on in someone's eyes when they accept Christ and experience his love and forgiveness. It's an awesome thing. It's an awesome privilege. But being a missionary as a vocation requires sending by a mission board or by a church. Paul was sent out, but he usually sent the offerings to the poor churches. And occasionally he made tents to provide for his own support and living expenses. Today, some of us in Heartsong Church are called to minister to outsiders. And in a spiritual sense, we are sent by the church. I know somebody who ministers in her workplace. And how could that happen if she wasn't in that specific workplace? So I recognize that as a calling. And I'm thinking also of alms, you turn for Christ, and motorsports ministries. Now, in addition, we also financially support mission organizations who go beyond what we can do. Black Sheep, Lions, uh, Operation Christmas Child, Samaritan's First Purse, and Faith Comes by Hearing. Oh, that comes right out of this chapter. Do you know there's 7.9 billion people in the world? And there are 7.5 billion printed Bibles. Problem is, I think Cheryl and I have 10 of them. <laughs> so not everyone has a printed Bible. And it doesn't matter because one-third of the world's population can't read anyway. So, Faith Comes by Hearing uses advanced technology in partnership with other mission organizations to record the Bible in the heart language of the people. They've already completed audio Bibles in more than 3,000 languages. They make it possible for everyone to hear the gospel using solar-powered players where there's no electricity. And if there's no internet, they also create soundtracks to the Jesus film, which was produced some years ago by Campus Crusade, and, and they broadcast it on solar-powered projectors. Faith Comes by Hearing has a goal of producing an audio recording of the New Testament in every language in the world by 2033. You know, that's only nine years from now. Yeah, many of us will be alive to see the Great Commission completed in that fashion. But I believe God is not limited by us. He could supernaturally uh, provide the gospel to every soul in the universe in a way that we might not even imagine. Now, verse uh, 15 goes on and says, As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Aren't these beautiful feet? <laughs> Never mind the face. Many of you also have beautiful feet because you have shared the gospel. Or you've invited people to come and hear the gospel, trusting that they will hear it here. Verse 16. But... They have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Sad but true, many in Paul's time did not respond to the gospel. In fact, they assassinated as false teachers 
Stephen and then James and eventually all the apostles except John. It could be discouraging for one who obeys God's command to share the gospel when we are persecuted and see no results. But in many cases, we might not see the results or hear about them. But we can trust God's word when he says, my word goes forth from my mouth and it shall not return to me void. But I will accomplish what I please. Trust God. Saving faith is expressed when you hear God's word and you respond. That's why we here at Heartsong Church put such an emphasis on the word of God. Because by hearing the word of God, our faith is, is grown, it's expanded, it's strengthened. Verse 18. But I say, have they not heard? Well, yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the earth. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found, he's speaking the word of God, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. Showing God's sovereignty. Because Israel rejected God, he called people to faith who were not part of Israel, Gentiles. This would cause Israel to be jealous, and we'll read more about that next week. The word foolish means ignorant and without understanding. Israel had the benefit of God's word, God's prophets, and God's promises, but they rejected him. But now, God has made himself known to the Gentiles who had none of these benefits that the Jews had. And many were responding by faith. Now today, we have access to the truth. But still, many remain, I would say, willingly ignorant of God's word and his grace. Jesus gave parables describing Israel's rejection of Christ and his invitation of the Gentiles. After entering Jerusalem and driving out the money changers, he went out, to the, out of the city to Bethany and then taught in Matthew 21, verses 33 and following. This is what he said. Here in another parable, there was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and sent a, set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when vintage time grew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, 
what will he do to those vine dressers? They said to him, who were listening, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it, and whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables they perceived that he was speaking to them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because the multitudes took him for a prophet. The other vine dressers that the landowner invited to tend his vineyard represent Gentiles. The Jewish religious leaders knew that this parable was about them mistreating God's prophets and then having their privileges extended to the Gentiles. It provoked some to jealousy, but it provoked others to faith. Well, just because the Gentiles are getting that, it doesn't mean we want to spite off our nose Cut off our nose to spite our face. Yeah, thank you. And they wanted to participate. Back in Romans verse 21. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. He has never stopped. Just as in Paul's time, there are people in our day who have heard the word of the gospel and not responded. Well, it's not over till it's over. Even the thief on the cross in his last hour of life turned to Christ and was saved. We never know what transaction will occur between people in their last moments of life and their first moments in eternity. But those who did not respond in the Old Testament, God called stiff-necked. To be called stiff-necked created a visual picture of an ox that wouldn't go where it was intended to go by its master. You remember in Acts 9.5, this imagery was applied to Paul himself by God when he said to Paul, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Goads are like cattle prods. Paul had been stiff-necked, a stiff-necked ox that would not go where God directed until God knocked him down with a bolt of light. In Acts 7.51, Paul had been present when Stephen said to his persecutors as they stoned him to death, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. My friends, what is your heart condition? I pray that none of us are hard-hearted or stiff-necked. I pray that our ears are open and our hearts are soft to receive God's word and to act upon it in faith. I pray that we will appreciate God's grace and respond to his invitation and accept his commission as disciples 
Pray with me. Almighty God, thank you for the, your word this morning and the reminder it contains that your grace is sufficient. Your word never returns to you void. And that we need not be discouraged when we are faithful to share it. Because we don't necessarily have to see the results of it to trust you to be faithful to your word. So we ask you, Lord, to help us to have our ears open and our heart soft to receive and our feet to be beautiful in responding to the message of the gospel and sharing it with others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.